You are listening to Rootbound, a podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside. Rootbound is brought to you by soy. It's in everything. Hi, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of Rootbound. I'm your host, and my name is Steve. Now, Rootbound is the podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside. Each week, I invite a guest who joins me on the show to share about a plant that means something to them, and then I share with a guest about a plant that means something to me. And through this process, we can all learn more about plants and learn more about each other. But before we get to our guest segment today, I want to talk about a word, and that word is cultivar. One of the plants we're going to be talking about today is a specific cultivar, and so I thought it'd be good to define that. I think, you know, I think we kind of all have heard that word and kind of understand what it means, but uh, there's actually a lot to cultivar, and I was pretty surprised when I looked up the Wikipedia page for cultivar, and it's pretty extensive because there's a lot going on there, and we won't get to all of it, but let's first just get to the basic Wikipedia definition, and Wikipedia says... That a cultivar is a type of cultivated plant that people have selected for desired traits and when propagated, retain those traits. So there's a few important things. You know, people cultivate plants, they select them for desired traits. So let's say the sweetness of an apple or the fall foliage of a tree. And, you know, through the process of selective breeding, you can kind of uh, move traits to one way or another and and have desired traits. Uh, So that's one part of being a cultivar. But the second part of being a cultivar is that when propagated, those those traits must remain. So often when you, you know, if you grow a new apple from seed, that apple tree that grows from that seed will be very different. The apples will be very different from the mother tree. So uh, you have to propagate a cultivar often in different ways, like division, uh, stem cuttings, grafting, tissue cultures, things like that, in order to keep the traits that were cultivated in the first place. So that's a cultivar. And interestingly, the word cultivar is kind of a relatively new word. It was invented by an American horticulturist named Liberty Hyde Bailey. And he came up with this concept of a cultigen. This is the idea of like, these are plants that have been cultivated by people and their properties have changed as opposed to how plants kind of change phenotypically in the wild. A cultigen is a plant that, you know, has been changed by man. But um, a cultigen is a bit broader than a cultivar because you could be like growing things in your garden and having different traits, but not actually keeping those traits consistently. So a cultivar is kind of a coalesced cultigen to having specific traits and often having an official name by a international body that uh, like names cultivated plants, which is pretty cool. So anyway, that's what cultivar means. And I think a good example of of a, of different cultivars uh, and kind of like help me understand what a cultivar really is are the cultivars of the plant Brassica oleracea. And uh, the Brassica is originally a form of wild cabbage, but it has over many, probably thousands of years, but some newer than that, uh, has many different cultivars. And these plants look very different from each other, but they are in fact the same species. So, so the species Brassica oleracea consists of different cultivars such as cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts, collard greens, kohlrabi, etc. So all those different vegetables that I mentioned, they're the same species. They're just different cultivars of those species. So that's kind of helped me uh, understand that a little bit more. And, and you might be saying, wait, those are such different plants. How, why are they the same species? Well, they, they are. They're genetically the same species. And the way to think about it is thinking about like dogs. We kind of have cultivars with dogs too. We call them breeds, not cultivars. But a chihuahua and a mastiff are both canines, right? They're both dogs, but they look very, very different, but they have just been bred by humans to have different traits. Same thing with Brassica, to have different traits in the plants. So anyway, that's cultivar. We're going to hear about a different kind of cultivar in just a minute from our guest. So let's meet our guest. Here we go. That bit they just did reminds me of broccoli. Why? I hate broccoli. (laughs) Hi, Vikram. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Rootbound. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on. 
Do you have a plant to share with us today? I do, and it's a bad one. Oh. I, I, I don't know how you know. often we talk about bad plants, but I've got a bad plant for us. Uh, this is great. I'm, I, I, kind of, I kind of also have a bad plant for you. Spoiler, to, I, knew, I know what you're going to pick, and I'm very excited to hear from it. And so I thought when I tell you about my plant, I would kind of stick with the theme of, uh, of bad plants, even though... There's a twist here. Anyway, let, let's get into your plant. I'm very excited to hear about this because I know, I know, I know of it, but I don't know all the details about why it sucks so bad. <laughs> yeah, and I'm excited to hear from you about it. And, and I'm sure you've seen me like rant about it on on social media yeah. at least once or twice. Uh, my my plant is the calorie pear or the Bradford pear. Yes, that is that is all over the place. It's all over the place, and kind of worldwide, but especially here in the US, it was introduced in the 60s really as a, oh, I don't know, popular landscape plant. It's been around for, you know, 150 years or something in the US, but uh, native to the Far East, China, Vietnam, and the Rosace family. And uh, it has become a terribly invasive plant here in the US. That That makes sense. Okay, so now before we get too much into it, why did you choose it? Why is this plant meaningful to you? Well, you know, it's funny because they get planted. I, I, I have a background in landscape and um, I run a horticultural garden um, here where I work too. And and it's one thing that pops up in the landscape over and over and over again. And people like it. It's cheap. It grows fairly quickly, which is ultimately part of the problem. Uh, but there's just not a lot to love about this plant. Um, there are a couple that has, a, I'll say it has a couple of redeeming like values, but they don't outweigh the, the problem. So I, I picked this plan. One of the reasons it, it like gets to me is because it is across the U S becoming such an invasive plant, uh, from Texas East, pretty much in 25 States, it has escaped sort of like residential or ornamental cultivation. It's out in the wild. It's made its way out into the landscape. Very interesting. Okay, so I have a quick question already before I get into more. I've heard of Bradford pear and calorie pear. Is there a difference? What's the story with a calorie pear versus a Bradford pear? Are they yeah. the same thing? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. So um, they're both calorie pears, a uh, Pyrus calariana, uh, but Bradford is a um, cultivar. So it's, okay. a, it's a bread variety. So it was bred to have um, showy white flowers. It was bred to have kind of this like weird lollipop shape. Um, and it was selected for its fall foliage. And so it was for a lot of reasons, pretty popular when it first started entering the industry more, um, sort of widely, but a a lot of times, and, and this, this pops up over and over again in biology, especially when we're talking about landscapes and stuff, people didn't really understand how aggressive maybe this plant was, uh, in, in outside of cultivation. And it's not overall an unattractive tree right they're going to grow 25 30 feet tall so a kind of a a medium sized tree Uh, has big dark green leaves a very dense canopy Uh, like you said in the spring it's colored with or covered with bright white flowers before the leaves come out actually which is is pretty interesting so it's you know this big flush of white in the spring and then it gets really nice red fall color in the fall for a couple of weeks but aside from that, it's weak wooded. The branch angles are bad. You get an ice storm and half the trees laying in your yard or on your car <laughs> or in your living room or whatever. Um, it is susceptible to diseases. The fruits are only eaten by a few animals. Uh, most animals don't eat them, which means that they get spread around or they, they end up staying on the ground and germinating. And in roadsides and in open fields, sometimes where these escape cultivation uh, or escape kind of control you'll see just solid sort of monocultures of these where all the seeds drop and then germinate and they grow so fast that they go back to seed in a year or two and it's just this super fast cycle of of uh expansion let's talk about the fruit real quick because when you hear pear you're like oh that sounds great a pear but the fruit is not like what you expect right think think of it as a pear that you would shoot out of a slingshot rather than eat. <laughs> it's like the size of a marble. Uh-huh. It's hard. They're bitter. Uh, and the seeds have cyanide in them. Oh, and cool. so, so. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the things that like to eat them are kind of few and far between. Uh-huh. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I, I have, there. well, my neighborhood, there's some 
uh, I guess I guess maybe we could call them calorie pairs because they definitely have lost their lollipop shape. They've been, I think, wild for long enough that they yeah they look pretty scrubby. But yeah, I always look at the fruit, and I'm I'm really into um, I'm a beekeeper, so I'm really into oh, wow. making mead. And so I like trying to like collect weird things to put in my meat. And I've always thought I should try to get some of the the pear the the pears. But there's like a there's like a window of like I think a day when they're soft. Um, and, and then yeah. they fall off. Yeah. And if you miss it, God help you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but they're you know they're and I don't think they taste great. You know, it, processing them into something I don't know. I've never even thought of that. That's interesting idea. Uh, another irredeemable feature of them is while these beautiful white flowers are out, they smell like fish. Oh, wow. I've never noticed that, but I have a poor sense of smell. Yeah, it's like it's like if you walk by a fish market uh, <laughs> and like a whole bunch of Bradford pears out there, they smell terrible, like real, real bad. What a weird quality for a flower. I, well, <laughs> you know, I think there uh, it, it is interesting that I think probably the wild type calorie pears don't have that smell as much, but I think probably in the process of breeding it for uh, overall floral density and some of these other things we were talking about, they probably lost some of that native smell. Um, and you actually, and it's, it is interesting. Like as I look at, at, we do, okay. Full disclosure. You know, I said, I run a horticultural garden. We do have a large Bradford pear out there Oh, okay. Uh, and I prune on it every year and I'm doing my best to make sure it doesn't fall apart. As far as they go, it's a nice one, but we're down to one and if it got struck by lightning, I wouldn't lose much sleep over it. Right? <laughs> but it's here, and I'm in West Texas, where like every tree is a choice. Sure, you know, yeah. There's no native yeah. trees, so like if I've got a 30 foot tall shade tree uh, that gives me some color and is a, a potentially forage source for my pollinators, like I hesitate to just cut it down for for no reason. And in my climate, at least so far, we're dry enough that they don't tend to be very invasive where I am. I see. Um, they they like um, sort of lower pH soils and sort of moister conditions. So it's not as huge of a problem here, but uh, yet, as of now, you know. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. So, okay, so the smell makes sense because maybe the ones in my neighborhood have kind of rewilded themselves and gained back that. But the, the smell is, sounds like it's a... It's a uh, side effect of this, like selecting for other things. I, I think so. And what's interesting, though, is is and, and what I started to say a minute ago, and before I started chasing a different rabbit, is I actually see, yeah, honeybees visiting it, but also things like sweat bees and flies and other insects that hover flies and and even like black flies that might be attracted to more of that pungent smell um, when compared to like a more floral, like nectar smell. So it's interesting how even with something like this, like nature tends to adapt to it and figures out ways to still make it useful. Uh, That, that is really fascinating. I mean, thinking about how like adaptation works. First of all, I think a little bit strange for a pear because pears are like bee pollinated traditionally, right? Yeah. yeah, In general. But if you, I'm I'm just going down a rabbit hole. That's probably totally wrong, but I'm just imagining here. If you've now developed something to be like, in a 1950s city that's very like uh, completely like groomed and there's probably no bees anywhere in like 1950s America, maybe flies are a good thing. Maybe smell like fish is an advantage. Yeah. And, and you know, there's always ecological niches that yeah. end up, uh, especially yeah, in urban environments, they end up being unfilled and then something figures out how to fill them. Um, it, which is really, I mean, sort of a testament to the resiliency of nature. Uh, yeah. But that still doesn't make me want to plant a bunch of these. And and for my money, if I'm, and this is true, I think for, for me, for a lot of these ornamental fruit trees, I'd rather just plant the fruit tree. Yeah. Right. Like if yeah. I have the choice between a Bradford pear and a, um, you know, Pyrus communis, just the European pear, the Bartlett or whatever we get around here, I'm going to go for the one that I can actually get pears off of. Yeah. yeah. And those are pretty trees too. So like they still serve some of the same functions in the landscape. Um, and they don't smell like fish, and you can actually eat the fruit. And that feels like a win. Yeah, it seems weird that we kind of went down this rabbit hole of uh, as like a as a culture of like having non-edible fruit trees. It, yeah, strange. You know, a part of it is that they were developed as street trees in urban settings. So if you think about it, if you have an urban environment that you have to try to keep clean in some way, um, fruit trees are messy. Yeah, there's they, some mulberry they, trees around here that definitely show that. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, pear trees put on a lot of fruit. And if, if in the fall, when they're maturing and dropping off the tree, no one's there to either harvest them or pick them up or clean them up, then you end up with rotting fruit on the ground in the middle of cities. So a lot of our ornamental fruit varieties came out of this necessity to try to reduce that, which then reduces pest populations and rodent populations uh, and yeah. things like that. So there, there's actually a functional reason why we um, started developing some of these. It's just that now when we think about like food deserts and the fact that like people need food, I would rather have a fruit tree in a city so someone could go pick that fruit and eat it, you know? Right, it's, right. It's, yeah. uh, it, it's just, it's interesting to watch the interaction between like urban culture and urban landscapes and plants sort of ebb and flow over time based on the needs of a society. Right. Yeah. Super fascinating. Do you have any idea who Bradford was? I don't. <laughs> okay, I don't. So and true. it's funny because I actually tried to uh, start looking that up a little bit and I couldn't find a clear answer. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, trees are yeah named after whoever decided to breed it or pat right. patent it more than that. Uh, but no, I couldn't find a good a good answer on who Bradford was. Maybe he scrubbed his existence because he was shamed. Yeah, by that's the plant that, he that made. is certainly possible. <laughs> he's in he's in witness protection. <laughs> uh, very fascinating. Um, anything else to say? Any other fun facts or dazzling details about the Bradford pear or other reasons why it sucks? <laughs> oh, well, there's plenty. Um, but no, most I think the biggest ones are that they sort of fall apart. Um, like I said, they're weak wooded, and then. A lot of the places they grow, like I said, they ex escape containment. What's interesting, though, is there's actually in several states now a Bradford pear bounty program. Like if you cut down a Bradford pear, they'll help you replace it with something different. Oh, cool. Um, and if there's state programs in, in sort of efforts to... Um, minimize the spread of these trees and the invasiveness. So I, I don't want to get it wrong. I don't remember offhand, but I think like Mississippi, um, maybe Georgia's, but parts of the Southeast and the, and the Eastern U S they're starting to get into these programs where they'll actually pay you to get rid of them. That's interesting. I'm just imagining like a weird dog, the bounty hunter style show. <laughs> yeah, where guys like traveling to the States, <laughs> yeah. Collecting bread for pears and or it's like, a, or it's also kind of like a reverse Johnny Appleseed. Yeah. Running around with a chainsaw instead yeah. of a bag of apple seeds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What a great job. And I could use a job right now. Whoa, not just anyone can be a bounty hunter. You have to pass an online exam. Uh, no, wait, they got rid of that. There is a $10 filing fee, but you can get around it. Congratulations, you're now a bounty hunter. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing about the Bradford pear. Do you mind if I share a plant with you? I would love it. So this is a plant that I kind of think sucks. It, it, it probably doesn't. I, I have some very particular reasons why I don't like this plant. Um, though lots of people do, uh, and it's one of my hot takes. I, I can like go <laughs> off on this. Um, and, and, you know, I, there's definitely some more nuance like with the Bradford pear and also something that going, going way back to one of my early episodes where we talked about corn and how corn is just like taken over the planet mm -hmm. and the negative things that happen with corn. My, my, my friend who was talking about corn said this something, which I've, I've said this in a lot of other episodes. She said, you know, corn has kind of become negative in some ways, but it's not corn's fault. Same thing with the Bradford pear. Right. It's not Bradford pear, pear's fault. And then with this plant, same thing. And that plant, I'll say the I'll say the uh, Latin name first, which you'll probably know, and then I'll tell the audience. It is Prunus amygdalus, the almond, mm -hmm. the common almond. Um, and I'll get to why I don't like it in a minute, but but just for some of the fun facts and dozen details, and you can jump in anywhere that you have there. First, and I actually have a question too. So it, okay. it's it's Prunus, which is really interesting. I, Prunus is a really amazing genus with lots of mm -hmm. fruit in it, right? So the apricot, plums, peaches, plums, nectarines, peaches, yeah. Which is pretty a wide variety of fruits for one genus. Uh, but then there's this whole thing about subgenuses. Do you what do you, what do you know about subgeni? You know, I don't that's not something I dive into a lot. I I wish I knew. I wish I was better at taxonomy. Yeah. Um but I know that we find different ways to like subclassify things farther and farther and farther as much as we can, uh, which my students hate. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I tell them, listen, it's not my fault. I'm not, I'm not that guy. Uh, no. So I don't know a whole lot about that. So apparently the, the almond is prunus amygdalus subgenus amygdalus. Okay. But some people will put prunus persica in subgenus amygdalus too. So saying hmm. that the almond and the peach are in the same subgenus, which is interesting and more interesting, which I, I didn't, I, I think I, 
up until just like other yesterday when I was researching this, I never looked at an almond fruit, but mm-hmm. it just looks like a little fuzzy peach. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not really edible. It's the seed we're eating, but yes, right, right. Um, it, it looks very peach like. So that's, that's really interesting. Um, but, but why, why there's two reasons why I don't like almonds. First is I said, I'm a beekeeper. Um, right, right. And, and, uh, as you probably know, uh, the almond needs to be um, pollinated by a bee. Mm-hmm. Um, however, 99% of all the almonds grown in the United States are grown in California. 80% of the almonds in the world are grown in California. Oh, wow. In the Central Valley of California, there is no native pollinator for almonds. Fascinating. Okay. Yes. Okay. So that means that bees need to be trucked into California for three months every year. Yeah. And the statistic I've heard is up to 80% of all bees in the United States, 1.6 million hives are moved into California for three months, give or take. And then they have to move out because after the, after the, the blossoms fall, there's no more food. It's actually a desert for bees because there's yeah. so many miles and miles of almonds, but they only produce that nectar for that brief window. So it's really tough on bees. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, it's just a kind of a weird kind of like... Just seems very strange to me to, to do this whole like rigmarole for an almond. It's kind of a lot of work. And yeah. it, it kind of drives home the the point. And I talk to people about this some that like honeybees are essentially livestock. Yeah. I mean, like we treat them that way, right? We move them around. We use them for the things we need. We, I don't want to say graze them on almonds, but we sort of like forage yes. them. They go yes. and forage on them. Uh, and we manage them. They're managed colonies. They're, they're very much like livestock. And every now and then you'll see like a story of a truck full of beehives that turns over on the interstate or something. Totally. I, I you know, the local beekeeping club that happens, that's happened a couple of times and I just was not able to, but that's happened a couple of times and the call goes out to the beekeepers to go help because there's only so many people in the area have, have the gear mm-hmm. to like go where to take up the bees. But yeah, it is. I mean, the bee, bees are interesting as a beekeeper. There's kind of this interesting struggle as far as like, what is the responsible thing to do with keeping bees? Cause they are livestock. They are a non native species. They can out, out compete native pollinators, mm-hmm. but also I like them and I like honey. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, yeah, it's it's interesting. In other places, it's not like that. You know, there is no native honeybee to North America. But in places like Europe, they're, they're they are native, and and uh, um, certain you know f- you know crops have kind of a, a native relationship with with those uh, bees. I've been, I've been to Romania a bunch of times, and they have this really great um, culture of beekeeping, where they have these cool trucks and they drive them around, and that's you know been going oh, that's on cool. for a long time. Um, so anyway, that's one reason I don't like them. It's just kind of this exploitation of the honeybee for for almonds and it's like do we really are almonds really worth that um <laughs> particularly because i mean they're they're i like almonds like to eat but there's a lot of other awesome nuts out there yeah. that i feel like have been completely overshadowed by the almond yeah and the reason why is the other reason i don't really like almonds and that has to do with water and california um there's a statistic that's going around that says almonds, it takes one gallon of water for every almond. Wow. I had, yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. However, I found this other, and it was really interesting. I found this other story. It's an academic paper called Water Index Benefits and Impacts of California Almonds in the journal Ecological Indicators by Julia Fulton, Michael Norton, and Fraser Schilling. And this is a really interesting article, which I'll link in the show notes. But in their estimation, they said that the water footprint, which I think is a little bit different from like how much it takes to make an almond. Mm-hmm is 3.2 gallons per almond. That makes the almond by far the most water-consuming agricultural crop, like far, far beyond. Wow. There, there's been a little bit of, um, and there's some cool, there's some cool uh, graphs in this article, which I'll, I'll put in the show notes. There's been a lot of kind of like, I feel like the almond industry has been fighting back and trying to show that almonds are like still good. And all they do is compare almonds to beef. And I'm right, like, right. Mm, okay, yeah. Almonds are almonds are better than beef. Yeah, and it's not the same <laughs> like yeah, it's it's sort of yeah, two two separate things. Totally. And like yeah, I I mean I s- still eat some beef every now and then trying to cut down cuz I'm also like an environmentalist, but still I don't think it's really fair to compare almonds to beef. Right. And when you compare it to any other like agricultural crop, it's like so much more water. And so then that leads to the question of why are we growing this many almonds? 
And it comes down to water, but it comes down to money. Hmm. An almond is a really, really great way to convert water to cash. I, I like that. That's interesting. And I, I, I didn't come up with this on my own. Most of this came from, um, I saw a documentary a number of years ago, and shout out to my friends at the uh, um, Washington, D.C. Environmental Film Festival. But this film was called Water and Power, a California Heist. Uh, I forget the director. It's produced by Alex Gibney. It's on Disney+. Plus. I just rewatched it in preparation for this. But a really interesting story about kind of this, the water story of California. And it kind of makes the villain, this guy, last name Resnick, who owns the wonderful company. They make pomegranate mm-hmm. juice. They make almonds. They make pistachios. And, and kind of showing that this is a way to just get the water that's coming from the California aqueduct and from groundwater in California, which is a huge issue, and then turning it into a, a very durable food that can be exported and just making tons of money. And, and uh, this article, this, this um, academic paper I mentioned, ranks, ranks crops on their water use, but it also ranks them on their nutritional value mm-hmm. and their economic benefits. And there's a lot of articles out there, I think, also from the almond industry saying, well, they are the most economical, beneficial plant, too. And that is true. By far, they, 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 they bring in a ton of money. But that's money. That's money, right? That's yeah, not right. food. And that's not economic value. I mean, that's not uh, 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 ecological value. And on top of that, 70% of the almonds are exported. Wow. So that's, this is essentially saying, okay, we've got this water in California how can we turn that water into money and just send it? So it's like we're sending gallons of water overseas um, and the almond is just a convenient mechanism to do that. That's fascinating. I've never thought about it in those terms, uh, but it's so accurate. I mean, it really is. Because like you said, there's a lot of other tree crops, nut crops we could be growing that are way more efficient, that have probably higher protein value and all that stuff. Uh, totally not so that's that's really interesting yeah my, my two favorites on those notes are one i feel like the hazelnut is like not not um given enough credit at least in the united states and there is an, a native american hazelnut i think a lot of people hmm. don't know that i'm growing two in my yard cool. i think they're not as productive and i think they have some agricultural issues perhaps with local uh you know diseases that makes them a little bit harder to to cultivate but they grow a lot of hazelnuts in oregon and they're wind pollinated, so you don't have the bee issue. Right. And apparently, they're a lot more um, drought tolerant as well than the almond. So, and and they're a true nut, which uh, the almond is not. Potentially right. a nut. It is a droop, which it's is a my droop. favorite. My <laughs> my favorite classification of fruit is the droop. Um, and then the other one is is uh, pecans. They're yeah. awesome. Pecans are great. And those trees produce so many nuts. Well, they do, and they're they're, they're also natives. Droops, though. Well, yeah, but they're they're native to wide swaths of the u.s uh, yeah. texas and the south and um yeah they're very productive they can be eaten fresh high protein content uh have zinc and a lot of other things in them um but they also can be pressed in oil that has similar smoke points and qualities to olive oil oh wow um, uh, it doesn't have some of the uh, oleic acid and a few of the other things but as far as like cooking value it's like using olive oil that has a little bit of a nutty flavor Oh, that, that, I've never used pecan oil. I'm going to have to, uh, to uh, seek that out. So anyway, that's what I have to say about almonds. Uh, you know, they're not a bad tree. And in where they're grown natively, they're probably great. I, sometimes I'll buy Marcona almonds, which are these Spanish almonds. Mm-hmm. And I have to, like, give myself a little bit of a, of a break. It's like, okay, well, these are probably grown with, like, non-trucked in bees however they did get shipped across the water in a ship so (laughs) carbon footprint anyway i'll sometimes have those because i'm just against the california almonds also i think they're better almonds um last thing though about almonds and another negative thing on their side is just marzipan right this the worst the worst candy (laughs) oh yeah that is i'm you know i it's funny though because i do like almond joy Oh, really? I do. And that's for whatever reason, that's like one candy that I really enjoy. And uh, do you know, and and you may not know the answer to this. um, It just popped in my head. Do you know what percentage of the almonds grown in California or wherever are used to produce like almond milk or milk substitutes or anything like that? I don't. I do have one fact, which I forgot about on milk, though, almond milk, though. Um, And it is a lot. And I think as far as like the milk substitutes, it's kind of the worst water wise Hmm. for sure. And this thing, this quote I found says it takes for one glass of almond milk, it takes 74 liters of water. That's a lot. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of other great milk alternatives out there. I think everyone is kind of saying that oat milk is kind of the best as far as like, 
ecological value. Sure. Um, but uh, but almond milk is is yeah, and it's a huge market for sure. Um, and then it gets even worse because you start shipping almond milk around. You're you're you used all this water to make this milk, and now you're shipping water. <laughs> Yeah, with fossil fuels around, and uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's a whole weird thing. And like I said, it's there's, I guess there's some like argument as to if it's actually better or worse water wise than dairy milk. That I think there's different arguments. It's it's definitely better greenhouse gas emissions than dairy. Like dairy is sure. terrible for greenhouse gas emissions, and almonds are actually you know pretty good for that because it's a tree and that yeah. You know. But but when it comes to just water per water. I think I've read both that almonds are worse than milk, uh, you know, dairy milk and our dairy is worse, but I'm not sure. That's interesting. So anyway, that's, that's almonds. That's my hot take on almonds. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty spicy. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, just as an aside, I grow peaches, I have peach trees. And if you crack open the pit, the seed looks just like an almond. They look exactly the same. Interesting. I, so I have a peach tree too. I've never, I don't think I've ever like cracked open the, what's that, that, what's the botanical word for the, 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 they, they call it a stone or it's the endocarp or whatever. But yeah, if you, if you crack that pit open, um, it's, it's essentially the shell around the, the seed and, uh, yeah, it, it looks just like a little almond, I, but they, I, but they have, uh, you know, the, I think one of the reasons we use almonds and they have to be processed a little bit, but like there's alkaloids and things in the, in the pits or in the seeds of peaches and other prunus. Um, so they're like, you, you can eat a few of them and some people do roast even peach seeds. Oh, interesting. Um, but you've got to be careful with how much you eat, depending on your sensitivity to some of these toxins and things. I see. I see. And so the, the, I guess the, the almond, and that's probably why they, there's so many different things, things in the prunus genus, is the almond was selectively bred over time probably to have an edible nut. Right. Whereas the peach was selectively bred to have the edible flesh. Very interesting. Yeah, I, I have to pay attention to that when the um, oh, when the peaches come in on my tree this year, if, if they do. Um, I, had a, I had a pretty, yeah, last winter, pretty heavy snow kind of took a lot of branches down, mm-hmm. and the tree was kind of in recovery mode last year, so I didn't get too many peaches. But yeah, take a look at it. It's interesting because they, yeah, you crack them open. You're like, oh, this just looks like a little almond. Very interesting. How, you you don't have any problem growing peaches out there in West oh, Texas? Oh, no, we do. No, we do. we absolutely do. Uh, <laughs> you know, years that, years that they do well, they do really well. And we have such hot, dry summers. I mean, we water, obviously, but that hot summer sun, like, really can, like, uh, saturates um, and concentrates the sugars in the fruit. So they actually taste really good. Like they're really sweet. Um, that's actually one of the reasons we grow wine grapes up here is that the the summer sun really concentrates those sugars in the berry. And so you don't have to add a whole lot of other things. Like we, we grow actually, and this is, this is an aside. I'm chasing a rabbit. I'm sorry. I love the, I love that. That's part of the podcast for sure. Keep going. Like 85% of the grapes crushed in Texas for wine are grown up here in the West Texas area. Oh, wow. Uh, we grow most of the grapes. And the problem is that peaches want to try to wake up like late March and will often get an April freeze. And I so, see. you know, we may make a crop six out of 10 years uh, here um, because we freeze out a lot. I see. That, that that's yeah that's interesting it's definitely the first uh, tree to bloom in my neighborhood is yeah. the is the peach tree um before we go i want to give you just a, ch- a chance to talk about the greenhouse you manage and also about your podcast yeah so i work at texas tech university here in, in lubbock texas and i manage our teaching and research greenhouse on campus and so uh we do undergraduate and graduate courses and labs and research and stuff here um, but then we also have three and a half acres of horticultural garden around the the greenhouse that is sort of a public green space, a public garden um, that we manage also as a teaching garden. Cool. And so uh, I, I teach half my time. I'm a lecturer. And then I manage the greenhouse and gardens with the other half of my time. So it's all plants all the time in my world. And what part of your time is dedicated to the podcast? You see, if you already used 100%. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it's funny because like in academia, we we use numbers like 100%. They don't mean anything because then another 20% of the time on top of the 100% goes into like podcasting or whatever. Um, 
No, I'm actually really fortunate. I yeah, I host the Planthropology podcast as well as I'm the co-host of another show called In the Grow, um, where we talk about like gardening on a budget. They are actually both part of my job. I have an outreach component to my my position, and I have um, sort of worked my way into having both of these podcasts be part of my job responsibilities. And so uh, I podcast at work. It's kind of fun. Uh, but yeah, the Planthropology podcast I've run for three years and change and uh, almost three and a half years. And I talk to scientists and students and um, green industry folks and uh, talk about what got them interested in the field, what they do, why they're still interested in it. And then along the way, we talk about sort of our human connection to nature and plants and the planet along the way. Very cool. Well, it is a great podcast. I like to listen to it. So audience, check it out. Well, thank you. Everybody's doing it, jumping for joy. Mmm, boy, almond joy. Mmm, boy, almond joy from Peter Paul. Finest tasting candy of all. Take golden toasted almonds, crisp whole almonds, dipped in smooth milk chocolate to seal in that fresh roasted flavor. Then bring on the coconut, so juicy, so tender. And top it all with real milk chocolate. Mmm, boy. Almond Joy. Juicy coconut, real milk chocolate, and golden toasted almonds on every double bar. Peter Paul Almond Joy. Indescribably delicious. What a fascinating and thought-provoking conversation we had with Dr. Vikram Balika about the Bradford pear and the almond. And after talking with Vikram, I went down a rabbit hole about the Bradford pear, mostly because I wanted to figure out who Bradford was, which I did figure out based on an article from the New York Times, which was published in 1964 with the title, Bradford pear has many assets. New ornamental fruit offers sturdy form and early bloom. And this is a pretty interesting article that is kind of touting the qualities of the Bradford pear. But in the article, it mentions that the Bradford pear was named after one F.C., which I believe stands for Frederick Charles Bradford, who was the former horticulturist in charge of the Glendale USDA Plant Introduction Station, which is a place where the USDA would uh, cultivate plants from around the world for introduction to the U.S., and that's what happened with the Bradford pear. And uh, F.C. Bradford, even though he wasn't specifically responsible for the Bradford pear, was the former and late horticulturist of that station where the original Bradford pear was cultivated. So that's who Bradford was. That's pretty cool. This article is pretty interesting. It says lots of interesting things about the Bradford pear. And here's one little sentence that I uh, that stood out to me, particularly with what we know now about the Bradford pear. It says, The abundant fruits are the size of marbles, russet in color. The fruits are considered a reasonable, attractive asset after the leaves have fallen. If not eaten by birds or squirrels, the miniature pears gradually dry up and disappear there was none of the objectionable littering common with other fruiting trees. So as Victor said, you know, this, uh, this quality in a urban area to not have fruit everywhere is one of the reasons why it was desirable. But this line about how the miniature pears gradually dry up and disappear is a little bit dubious. I think those uh, seeds were not disappearing, but perhaps uh, getting into the environment. But as I went further down my rabbit hole about the Bradford pear, I found another amazing article this one published in 2017 in Arnoldia, which is the magazine of the Arnold Arboretum at Harvard. And this article is by Teresa M. Cully. And this is called The Rise and Fall of the Ornamental Calorie Pear Tree. And this is just an entire article all about how the calorie pear came to the United States, how it became introduced as this uh, ornamental tree, and its fall from grace. And the one thing that I, I think we didn't talk about, which I found super fascinating, is how it started to spread in the wild. And I think this was a kind of unintended consequence. So the original Bradford pear is self-infertile. So if there are multiple Bradford pears in a neighborhood, you will not get fruit that is fertile. And that means that it's not going to spread into the wild, which is great. However, the popularity of the Bradford pear led to other cultivars of the calorie pear to be developed for different, slightly different characteristics. And because of that, there were now different cultivars in the same areas. And even though individual cultivars were not self-fertile, if they were planted near a different cultivar, now they were fertile. 
and they could produce seeds that created new trees. And that popularity of the original Bradford pear, which led to the popularity of other cultivars, led to the situation where we have fertile trees in neighborhoods that are spreading this pear into the wild. So I thought that was very interesting. You know, it's that story of unintended consequences, and I think that's something that, you know, humans have to struggle with, you know, with plants, but also lots of other things. And I think it's our challenge as humanity to uh, to try to be as careful as possible with how we deal with things like this, with how we uh, intervene in nature because of those unintended consequences. You know, I don't think that would have ever been predicted when the original Bradford pear was uh, created. You know, this pear couldn't spread in the wild because it was self-infertile, but of course it became so popular. Then it led to the circumstances where it could spread in the wild. And now it's all over the park in my neighborhood. So a really interesting story. And I want to thank uh, Vikram for sharing it with me. And uh, I'm going to link all the stuff I mentioned in the show notes. And that's our show for today. Thanks for listening. My guest on this episode of Rootbound was Dr. Vikram Baliga. Vikram is a lecturer of horticulture, greenhouse and horticultural gardens manager, and the host of the Plant Anthropology podcast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. If you like Rootbound and you want to help it keep going, you can find out ways to support the show at rootboundpodcast.com slash support. Rootbound is hosted by the anti-almond Steve Ellington. Music by Christian Krigaskota. Fake ads by David Lani. Rootbound is a podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside, but if you can go outside, you could start your career as a Bradford Pear bounty hunter. Tofu, miso, soy sauce, teriyaki, gravy, crackers, hot dogs, chocolate, mayonnaise, crayons, adhesives, lubricants, industrial solvents, soy. It's in everything.